As I'm sure you know, I don't have all the answers, but I'd like to present what I believe could be a possible answer and then you can continue studying it for yourself. I won't take the time to go into all the details regarding this claim now, but if I get the chance later or if someone requests it, then I certainly will. One of the most famous allegations as to what the whereabouts of the Ark of the Covenant is that it was taken to Ethiopia. Since the earliest 20th century right up to today several books have been published covering this theory i must confess i haven't read everything on the topic but i have read some of the material and this is what i've learned it is alleged that the real ark of the covenant was taken to ethiopia and is now residing in a chapel in the city of axum the church is called the church of lady mary of Zion. As you can see here, there are fences surrounding it and is guarded so that no one can gain access to see it. They used to retrieve it for a procession once a year, however in the last several years, possibly a few decades now, they have only displayed a replica in these processions. There are many replicas of the Ark in various Orthodox churches all over Ethiopia. The tradition that the real Ark was taken here is very strong amongst the public and it has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, if we refute this claim, we are essentially rocking the entire identity of the people in this region of Ethiopia. So it's a very sensitive subject for great many people. One theory is that the Ark was brought here after King Solomon gave it to the Queen of Sheba. Another theory is that the Queen was seduced by King Solomon and came back to Ethiopia where she gave birth to what is claimed to be Solomon's son named Prince Menelik. This son supposedly went up to Jerusalem and stole the Ark while Solomon was still king in Israel. A third suggestion covered in many of the books on this topic is that the Jews who survived the destruction of the temple brought the ark with them to Egypt and from there to Ethiopia. Now if you want now if you would like me to address any of the other Ethiopian theories feel free to let me know which one but for now I will just look briefly at these three. So back to point number one, there is so far no evidence that the Queen of Sheba ever ruled in the area of North Ethiopia. It's worth mentioning that no kingdom, house, structure or settlement found anywhere in Ethiopia can be identified with the Queen of Sheba and her son. Furthermore, there is no biblical evidence telling us that she was given the Ark. In the Bible it says nowhere what area Sheba came from nor what tribe. According to the Muslims, Sheba and her kingdom was Arabian, located in the area of Saudi Arabia and later Yemen. The Quran mentions Sheba before Ethiopian sources. There is no evidence that a kingdom ruling in Yemen also ruled in Ethiopia in the time of King Solomon, although it did much, much later in time. The Queen of Sheba could come from at least two possible tribes. In the book of Genesis, we can see how the first great men after the flood started tribes and kingdoms were called after them. They all descended from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. For instance, Egypt's real name is Mizraim after Ham's son. And the whole Egyptian people once originated from his line. And every time it says Ethiopia in your Bible, it really says Cush. Cush was Mizraim's brother, also son of Ham and the land of Cush was in Nubia or today's Sudan. Now Cush did have a son named Sheba and his tribe could have been the one the Queen of Sheba came from. Although no evidence of her kingdom in Aksum, some suggested her kingdom was among the Cushites further north, although the Bible indicates no such thing. What we do see in the Bible is that the Cushites and Egyptian picks a fight with Solomon's son and the kingdom of Sheba is not mentioned. However, the kingdom of Sheba is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, always as a rich, independent kingdom. 
Now the Kushids are shown through archaeology to have been a nation that have previously been slaves and subdued the Egyptian pharaohs for a long time. The biblical description of them is harsh, knowing they once were slaves for the Egyptians. It says, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Kushid captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt, and they shall be afraid and ashamed of Cush, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. Isaiah also mentions Sheba, however, in a totally different context, and I'll show you in a bit. Through archaeology, we know that the Kushids had a lot of cattle, and that these animals were important to their kingdom. However, the Queen of Sheba brought no cattle to Solomon. She brought gold, camels, and spices. The kingdom of Sheba was great and rich. The Bible says she came with a great company and a great train with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. Although things go downhill for the Cushites, the kingdom of Sheba continues to be described as rich and a place of trade. Even a prophecy given in the time of Isaiah, they are described as a wealthy nation even in the future. All they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and innocence, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. This is a very different fate than that Isaiah just described for the Cushites. The kingdom of Sheba might not have anything to do with Ham and his son Cush at all. In the Bible there is another tribe of Sheba. Noah's son Shem had a son named Arpachshad and his son Salah had a son named Eber and Eber's son was called Yuktan. Yuktan had a son named Sheba. Sheba's brothers Ophir and Havilah became name of kingdoms, so why not Sheba? Also the Bible mentions Sheba as a place where there is gold. The land named after Sheba's brothers Ophir is also connected to places with much gold and so Sheba might be in the same area as his brother's kingdoms Ophir and Havilah. In Isaiah the kingdom of Sheba is mentioned alongside the kingdoms of Medium and Ephah, Median's son. The Bible does say where Sheba Yuktan's son settled. Sheba and Zophir and Havilah and Yubab, all these were the sons of Yuktan, and their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest to Sephar, a mount of the east. So this is east in Arabia. Sephar is identified by scholars and historians to be in today's Yemen. However, this can also be questionable. And so the Queen of Sheba might just as well be the Queen of a kingdom descended from Yuktan's son. The Kingdom of Sheba would then be closely connected to Abraham's family tree, which would make it not so unlikely for the Queen to come and see the greatness of their distant, distant cousins. And notice what it says when the Book of the Kings talk about Sheba's visit, and she gave the King an hundred and twenty talents of gold and of spices very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ufid, brought in from Ufid great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. And so gold from Ophir came at Sheba's visit, indicating she did have something to do with the kingdoms of Yuktan's sons. And so it speaks directly after the story of Sheba, how Solomon started a trade not only with Ophir, but also the Arabian kings. A descendant of Shem and not Ham, placing Sheba amongst the ancestors of Shem and not Cush. So the point here made is that Sheba is never tied to slavery or any of the Cushid wars and is always explained as a place of wealth and trade for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so with no other than Ethiopian Christian myths of Sheba, there is little to tie Aksum with Sheba. And so the question regarding the Ark in Ethiopia is not just if it was taken there. 
it's even questionable that the kingdom of Sheba was there at all. There is no evidence. Also, Cush's son might have had a tribe named after Sheba, but even if one was found, it could still be the wrong tribe. So I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm just saying there are more than one possibility. But let's go on and say it might have been there and continue to point number two. Let's look at the more traditional story now that a son of Solomon brought the Ark to Ethiopia. Firstly, there is no archaeological evidence even to his existence, nor are there any traces of the kingdom he allegedly ruled. Not a single kingdom in all of Africa that was subsequently established ever mentioned Sheba or the Ark of the Covenant in the numerous texts they left behind. So in the ancient books of the kings and the Bible doesn't confirm this story and there is no mention of it in the subsequent literature of the kingdoms of Africa, one could safely conclude that the myth is a relatively recent one and was never heard of during the time of the Old Testament. Some historians think the myth was fabricated during the Christian era after they were influenced by the Arabians. The theory that the monarchs in Ethiopia even descended from the union of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba is highly debatable. From Babylon and the kingdoms in Mesopotamia all the way down to the Roman Empire, it was very common to fabricate various myths and fables exalting local heroes and leaders. Ethiopia had such a strong Jewish and Christian background that a Judeo-Christian story such as this could easily have been concocted in order to win the hearts of the people. Even today the popes try to legamize their authority by claiming their lineage to the apostle Peter. Bear in mind, there is no evidence Peter even was the first pope, yet Catholicism copied the Roman religion, which in turn copied from Greek and Mesopotamian traditions. Just as a matter of interest, the biblical clearly teaches that a person's lineage is no way legamizes their authority as a representative of God if they themselves refuse to do what is right. As I said, it was commonplace in ancient times and throughout Mesopotamia and the Roman Empire for leaders to make up stories that either linked them to popular gods or claimed they were descendants of a former ruler of high or even heroic esteem. The purpose of course being to elevate themselves and establish themselves as a legitimate king over the region. Some have tried to further investigate the claim that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. One of them was Professor Edward Ullendorf, who wrote a book on Ethiopia and the Bible published by the Oxford University Press. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Ullendorf declared that he had personally seen the object in Oxum. They have a wooden box, but it's empty. Middle to late medieval construction, Ullendorf went on to say that the priest and the government perpetuate an aura of mystery around the object, mostly to maintain the idea that it's a venerated object. So Professor Ollendorf is suggesting that the box is from the Middle Ages. Several other things also seem to connect it to the Middle Ages. And remember, at the birth of Roman Christianity and throughout all the Dark Ages, the Christians made relics that they placed in various churches. Various relics and many of the holy places were created by Constantine's mother, among others. This was to create alternative places of worship to replace the pagan sites all for the purpose of making Christianity the primary religion. So the fabrication of a myth about a holy Judean Christian object was very common for that time. In fact, it was a big business back then, just to have something to attract pilgrims with. Another thing suggesting it was made in the Middle Ages is the appearance of its replicas. In the Dark Ages, there were little knowledge about the ancient measurements. They could easily have made the mistake of using the wrong cubit. One of the earliest texts recording the Ark being in Ethiopia dates from the 13th century and describes the Ark as follows. It is as high as the knee of a man and is overlaid with gold and upon its upper corner there are crosses of gold and there are five precious stones upon it, one at each of the four corners and one in the middle. This does not match the biblical description of the Ark at all and agrees much more with the 13th century design than that of the Bible. The symbols such as crosses were common in the early Christian era. 
Of course, crosses was very often used in the Middle Ages as well. And so it is my opinion that the Ark in Ethiopia probably dates to the Middle Ages. Another potential problem is how can God choose them to store the Ark for so many centuries when they placed adulterous images in the same church area. This, by the way, is a violation of the second commandment of the very law inside the ark. Does God all of a sudden condone graven images, or is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? We read in Ezekiel that God removed his glory from the temple in Jerusalem for that very reason. They placed graven images all around the temple and worshipped the Queen of Heaven, and that's exactly what these custodians in Ethiopia are doing. I'm going to talk more about this in the next episode. Nevertheless, I understand that you may not accept the arguments presented so far, and if you strongly disagree with me, then that's okay. You don't have to listen to me, but please listen to the Bible, because the biggest problem with the ark being taken by King Solomon's alleged son is that it goes against the clear record of the Bible. The most important biblical evidence proving the ark was never handed over to the queen of Sheba or her son is the fact that according to the Bible the ark was still in Jerusalem over 300 years after King Solomon ruled. This is 300 years after the theory alleges it was either carried, stolen or given away. King Yoshia said, Unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. Thus, the only Old Testament source that tells us there even was a queen of Sheba is the same source that says the ark was still in Jerusalem approximately 30 years before the city was conquered by the Babylonians. So the Bible proves the Ethiopian story to be false. Now I have researched one publication that suggests the Israelites built two arks and tries to use scripture to support the theory. However, none of the scriptures they use actually prove their theory. Of course, there's much speculation as to what happened to the first set of tables of stone which Moses destroyed. But just because he destroyed the first set, it doesn't mean they were placed in a replica of the ark. I am not saying it didn't happen, but the point is that the Bible never mentioned what did happen to them and certainly doesn't say that a second ark was even built. So if all we have is speculation and conjecture, no matter how good it sounds, it's still just a guess. Secondly, regarding the Queen of Sheba, in the books of Kings and Chronicles, histories were recorded in very great detail. That which the king had to deal with was recorded, domestic and foreign unrest, as well as the very actions they themselves carried out as king. Even if it would condemn them, the record was faithfully written down. Like for instance, when King Solomon erected pagan pillars for his adulterous wives, it was all recorded in these books. Now, if King Solomon had given away the most important artifact to a queen from the south, or if this artifact that Solomon had been told was God's dwelling place among them had been stolen, the very place the Lord would rule from, it would most definitely have been written down in the Chronicles along with all the other things that the kings did and didn't do. Equally, if it was stolen, it would have been recorded just like as it was when other rulers stole things of significance from Israel. Whenever something was stolen, it was recorded. Lastly then, the Bible tells us that Solomon had peace from his enemies, so if his son raided the temple, it would contradict God's own word. According to the Bible, Solomon never suffered anyone coming to Jerusalem to steal from him. David had received the following promise from God about his son Solomon. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. Does that sound like it's even possible that God's throne could have been stolen from Israel during Solomon's reign? 
Solomon failed God, but because of God's promise to King David, God would not allow any conflicts to enter the kingdom of Israel until after Solomon had died, as recorded in the books of the kings. The, so these two important scriptures revealed to us that Solomon didn't have to endure any enemies raiding Jerusalem, and that the ark was still in Jerusalem long after his alleged son came and allegedly stole it. The third theory I would like to address, I believe is relatively new, or maybe it's not, I don't know. A brief summary of these theory suggests that after the Babylonians destroyed the temple and a small group of Jews survived, avoiding captivity, they decided to seek refuge in Egypt. This much is true and biblical, but the theory then goes on to suggest that they took the ark with them to Egypt and from there to Ethiopia. Now, the journey from Jerusalem to Egypt is described in detail in the book of Jeremiah, who also survived the destruction of Jerusalem. There is no mention of the ark. If they had, in fact, brought it with them, it would have been a major incident. Remember that God, dwelling above the ark, led the Hebrews whilst they journeyed from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land. Would they now try to lead the earthly throne of God back to Egypt? That would, without a doubt, have been unnoteworthy, to say the least, and would most certainly have been mentioned in the scripture. But no such event is described, even though their journey, their motives, and their unfaithfulness is all recorded. Even so, let's just say they did bring the ark with them. Does this mean they continued their journey to Ethiopia with the ark? Jeremiah was a prophet, and the Bible tells us that he was given the following prophecy about the people going to Egypt against the will of God. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even to the greatest by the sword and by famine, and they shall be an exer creation and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach strong words those who went to egypt would according to god not continue their journey on to ethiopia but all of them would die in egypt and if you take the time to read the whole chapter the fact that god would let them perish in the land of egypt is a symbol intended for us None of the earliest Jewish books that we have suggest it was taken to Ethiopia. There are all new theories based on the Ethiopian claim. However, both the ancient Jewish books of Baruch and the book of the Maccabees claims the Ark was hidden. One says underneath Jerusalem and the other in Mount Nebo. I will go into that last claim in a later question episode, but my point for now is that the ancient records nowhere claim it was taken to either Egypt or Ethiopia, and those ancient scriptures are the oldest we have that mention the final resting place of the Ark. Furthermore, they state that they placed it within the ancient borders of the nation of Israel. So I hope some of these thoughts were helpful in some way. Thank you for listening and the next question I will be addressing is when was the ark hidden and I believe the Bible actually gives us a few clues. A third suggestion covered in many of the books on this topic is that the Jews who survived the destruction of the temple brought the ark with them to Egypt and from there to Ethiopia. Now if you want now, if you would like me to address any of the other Ethiopian theories, feel free to let me know which one. But for now, I will just look briefly at these three. So back to point number one. There is so far no evidence that the Queen of Sheba ever ruled in the area of North Ethiopia. It's worth mentioning that no kingdom house structure or settlement found anywhere in Ethiopia can be identified with the Queen of Sheba and her son. Furthermore, there is no biblical evidence telling us that she was given the Ark. In the Bible...
to today, several books have been published covering this theory. I must confess I haven't read everything on the topic, but I have read some of the material. And this is what I've learned. It is alleged that the real Ark of the Covenant was taken to Ethiopia and is now residing in a chapel in the city of Axum. The church is called the Church of Lady Mary of Zion. As you can see here, there are fences surrounding it and is guarded so that no one can gain access to see it. They used to retrieve it for a procession once a year, however in the last several years, possibly a few decades now, they have only displayed a replica in these processions. There are many replicas of the Ark in various Orthodox churches all over Ethiopia. The tradition that the real Ark was taken here. As I'm sure you know, I don't have all the answers, but I'd like to present what I believe could be a possible answer, and then you can continue studying it for yourself. I won't take the time to go into all the details regarding this claim now, but if I get the chance later, or if someone requests it, then I certainly will. One of the most famous allegations as to what the whereabouts of the Ark of the Covenant is that it was taken to Ethiopia. Since the earliest 20th century right up here is very strong amongst the public and it has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, if we refute this claim, we are essentially rocking the entire identity of the people in this region of Ethiopia. So it's a very sensitive subject for great many people. One theory is that the Ark was brought here after King Solomon gave it to the Queen of Sheba. Another theory is that the Queen was seduced by King Solomon and came back to Ethiopia where she gave birth to what is claimed to be Solomon's son named Prince Menelik. This son supposedly went up to Jerusalem and stole the Ark while Solomon was still king in Israel. <laughs> 